you often hear the saying within luck, if I'm lucky, if I say I'm lucky, and people that are being polite to me say, well, Simon, you know, you worked hard. And then the people throw out quotes like, the harder you work, the luckier you get. You know, it's not true. The harder you work, the luckier you get is an Instagram quote that is not true. And I see it thrown around all the time. And I know plenty of people that have worked themselves to the bone, ended up mental health issues, physical issues. You know, working hard does not equal success. Many, many, many people have proved this, yet it's still the saying thrown around as if that's going to fix all your problems working hard. I was more successful when I worked less hard. <laughs> Simon Squibb is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Simon is an entrepreneur, angel investor, mentor, podcast host, founder, and chief purpose officer at the Purposeful Project. He has started 17 companies, invested in over 60 plus startups, and has mentored hundreds of founders. Having sold his award-winning branding and digital agency Fluid to Price Waterhouse Coopers, Simon now focuses on inspiring, motivating, and guiding both budding and experienced entrepreneurs by sharing his personal experiences, insights, ideas, and tips. His mission is to help 1 million people start and grow business of their own and he's also involved in many other investments and projects around the world. A couple of them are the Good Luck Club, um, a podcast, and his book is coming out soon called Hack Luck, and it should come out next year in January. We're going to touch and talk about all those things today on this episode of our podcast. Welcome, Simon. It's so good to see you, and thanks for coming on the show. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You're most welcome, and I'm so glad I've uh, been stalking you and seeing you online and your activities. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, you've been doing this for a while as far as branding and your company, Fluid, and, and kind of been involved in, in, in business and, and purpose of business and, and um, trying to find the brands and the focus inspiring and motivating people. Um, for me, I always take my my work, which is really I don't look at it like work, you know, kind of like Bob Proctor says, it's it's not really work. It's more fun or passion or purpose, you know, that why you do it and you just leap from bed and do it every day and, and uh, really enjoy it. But it get, I see it as as a model that gives you, you know, some sustainability, some resilience through tough times. It's a better operating system. And so my first question for you is, because of all this experience, because of all your companies, because of leadership, has that given you any resilience, any stability during this pandemic time? And, and my question is, how have you and the family weathered this pandemic? You're right in the middle of a new lockdown. How has it gone? How has it been? What experiences and things have you guys uh, had? And, and can you share that with us? Of course, yeah. Well. First up, um, I would just say that my bio uh, makes me sound amazing, but I, I, uh, I, I have started from humble beginnings. I, I left school at 15 years old and my mother kicked me out of home and I was homeless for about five days. And then, uh, and then I was forced to uh, get into entrepreneurship because I needed to suddenly pay rent in the squat that I managed to find myself in. And so, you know, I, I started off um, with, 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 with not such a glorious sounding CV as I have today. And uh, I, like, I like to highlight that for anyone out there that, uh, you know, uh, you kind of got to start somewhere. And, and sometimes if you start at the very bottom, it, it can actually be an advantage. And, and, I, and I, when you ask about resilience, that's what jumps in my mind, because I feel like, you know, once you've kind of gone through uh, certain types of pain, um, everything after that is relatively easy. And I think I would have said without doubt that it was never, never anything that hit me uh, in my life harder than, than when my father died and then I, I, I got kicked out of home and then I had to leave school. None of that seemed much harder, but COVID has brought a new level to things. Personally, I feel like I'm very lucky. Uh, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not 
I'm in my financially stable. I'm able to I'm able to spend time with my family without without concern that I can't pay my bills. So I consider myself very lucky. Um, however, it has spurred me, to, frankly, to come out of retirement. I, I left school at 15 and I retired at 40. I um, I didn't want to make mistakes with my father and, and keep working until I died of a heart attack from overworking. So I stopped working when I'd made enough money never need to work again. But but I, I decided to come back. Uh, into the fold, as it were, because I feel like I've got certain uh, knowledge that I think could help people right now, um, especially those that are made unemployed, can't find a job, coming out of university, can't find a job, or being furloughed as in England, and then uh, no job at the end of that furlough. So I feel it's my responsibility to come back with the skills that I have and start um, helping humanity. And, and I think, uh, so, so, so in a way, COVID has brought me back to business when before I was very much uh, in kind of a selfish mode for the last few years when I retired, where I did nothing but exercise, enjoy myself, play with my uh, little baby boy, who's now three, uh, and just, you know, just enjoy life um, after a lifetime of working hard. But I do feel now is the time, if you've got ability uh, to apply purpose and, and go into the workforce and help. So that's what I've been doing. But everybody's fine. Thanks for asking. We've just gone into lockdown here in London. So it's, of course, a very a strange time to go back into lockdown again and um yeah the rules aren't very clear so people are confused um but it's it's certainly um not 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 a not a good time for for anyone in the world and i and i feel like for my family we're, we're one of the lucky ones right now so i want to follow up and touch some of those things that you opened those up uh some some extra questions that i'd like to dive in deeper to and and if, if they're uncomfortable or you don't want to address them, just let me know. We won't <clears throat> touch on them. But uh, you said you were, you, you know, your, your father passed away, which is uh, horrific. And then your mother kicked you out. Um, did you, do you look back at that now as, uh, boy, uh, school of hard knocks or a rough lesson? Or, or, uh, but are you thankful for that? Have you mended ways with her? And, um, or, or is it still estranged and kind of what, what, what has there been a process in that as well? That, I mean, sometimes uh, when things, major events like that happen, there's, you know, permanent bitterness uh, or just uh, estranged of relationships that never get mended or never go back. Uh, or sometimes say, boy, I'm glad I got that wake up call at an early age, because it set me on this new path. So I'd like to get into a little bit more of what that was like, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, for me, I look back at my hard times in life with some appreciation. I think it's uh, it's not easy to have a, a very traumatic experience. I'm sure everyone's now feeling it through COVID. It's not, it's not good having a traumatic experience at the time in particular. But I do think a bit like COVID, it can bring some benefits you didn't expect. You just assume, you know, something horrible happens to you. My father passes away. Of course, that's a horrible experience at 15 years old. He died of a heart attack right in front of me. So, it, you know, without doubt, you know, I, I, that, that was a horrific uh, and sad experience uh, to, to go through at, at 15 years old. But in a, in a weird way, uh, and, and, I, and it took me a long time to, to see this, my father actually gave me a gift and I and I and, I, and as strange as it sounds, he gave me the gift to go and pick who I want to be. Whereas up until the point where I was living at home with my mother and my father was still alive, my life had been somewhat predetermined. My parents had identified that I was a pretty good um, speaker, a good person explaining things, a good person debating and arguing things, and therefore they had decided that I'd make a good lawyer. So they kind of mapped out a life for me. Um, that you know, if you asked me at 14 years old what I was going to be, I was going to be a lawyer. And so the idea of being an entrepreneur never really even hit me, although both my parents were entrepreneurs. It seems, as always, parents want you to have the opposite life to the one that they had. So to be a lawyer was this stable, prestigious thing that my parents wanted me to be. But when all of this happened to me, and I was suddenly living in this, uh, or initially living in the street, and then found a squat to live in, it, it kind of woke me up. In a, in a kind of purposeful way a part of me that had been I guess put to sleep by the type of life that I'd had the protected 
life with a clear path. I didn't need to think what I was going to be because someone had told me what I would be good at. And so I never really explored whether that was going to make me happy. It was just pre-programmed. And then when suddenly as I'm sitting in this kind of whole new world, I'm not surrounded by my family anymore. I'm not surrounded by my school colleagues anymore who all had a similar you know, uh, training to, to me. I was suddenly aware of the world in a way that I had never been. And at first, it's really scary. I tried to relate it to the movie The Matrix for those that haven't watched it. You know, the, the, the guy that lives in a computer program and doesn't realize it. And then he comes out of the computer program. And his first reaction is, oh my God, I want to go back into the computer program. <laughs> Um, and, and so I had, a, I think, a very similar experience. Initially, I'm like, my God, this, 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 this uh, squat is a nightmare. And this, you know, these people are, it's crazy. It's, I just, I want to, I don't want to worry about having to earn money. I, I just want to go back into, you know, doing what I'm told and getting my livings paid for. But then uh, something woke up in me and, 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 I, and I started a business. I, by accident, started a business and, and I never looked back. Um, and, and that's why today I'm, I'm on a mission to help other people realize that there, there's plenty of ways to live a life. Uh, and getting a mortgage, for example, and getting tied down into debt and getting a job that pays you a monthly amount of money and you perhaps do and don't enjoy it is not the only way to exist. And I think me being woken up in the, in the horrific way that I was through difficult circumstances gave me an insight into the world that I think, I think can be useful to people today that are going through any pain or any difficult time. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the reason I wanted to dive a little deeper into that is <clears throat> different cultures and all over the world, pretty much every human being goes through this rite of passage. Um, some are forced, some are not willed, and, and, um, and, and others actually are, are also skipping this rite of passage until something major happens in their life to kind of open their eyes or to see the world in a different way and so from what I hear that sounds like a real almost like a, a, a forced rite of passage you know you had this path that you thought you were on and now it, it just totally changed and it set you on this new course and and um, where you had to you know like the like the book that the uh, title that you've uh, got uh, hack luck you've got to kind of hack and figure it out really quick you know a couple days to figure out how you're gonna survive and go and move forward. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, the other reason I really ask that question is um, I, I speak to a lot of authors, a lot of futurists, a lot of social entrepreneurs around the world. And it's really funny how they talk and they speak about these things or their life in the past has really been one of uh, different businesses, innovations and authoring. And it's a lot of talk, but then when a pandemic or a hard time comes, you can really see if that has also been applied into practice into the lives. Do they have that re resilience or, you know, whatever. As a matter of fact, this, this year um, during the pandemic, there were several authors that I interviewed. All, all their books were launching during the pandemic. And so you'd imagine that type of, you know, they're like, oh, how do you launch a book and, and talk about a book during a pandemic or Others were uh, really dependent on speaking engagements during during this time that totally disappeared. So it's like a reinventing of yourself, and so that's kind of a, a leading question. Why I want to I want to I, I genuinely care, but I also want to know how how you've uh, applied those things during this time, um, and, and, and pull that out because our listeners really need to hear that because those are tools, tips, hacks that they can apply if they're struggling now to get to a better spot, to get into the future that they really want to actually, do they have a vision of the future or the goals and the direction they wanna go in and, and who's out there ready to help them. And so that's kind of the direction I'd like to take us as well today on, on our discussion. You have, have a project um, that deals with uh, kind of revitalizing libraries doing your podcasts in the libraries and, and uh, speaking with entre entrepreneurs in the library. Can you tell us how this pandemic has, has affected that? Are, are libraries, are you are doing social distancing or, or how is that going? And now um, a little bit more about your project as well, what the thought processes on that were. 
Sure. Well, there's a few things that you've asked there. So um, if I miss something, please pick me up on it. But basically, let me, let me just start off by, by, by saying to your audience that uh, I, I have gone through a tremendous journey um, building businesses. And when I retired at 40, I actually sat down and wrote my book. And I started out like I think a lot of successful entrepreneurs do, writing about how brilliant I am, about how I moved to Hong Kong at just the right time in 1997 when uh, Hong Kong was getting handed over back from the British to the Chinese and how you know I was there at the right time when everyone else was running away from that part of the world at that moment, thinking that China was going to turn Hong Kong into a communist state and roll in the tanks. I moved there. So I started writing about how brilliant I was in, in, in making these decisions. And then I realized as I started kind of really laying out honestly how I was successful, I realized I was lucky. There was a huge amount of luck that played a part in my life to uh, increase the chances of me being successful. And so, you know, I, you, and you kind of alluded to it a minute ago, I see a lot of these kind of inspirational quotes floating around. And I'm always very conscious to make sure that, that I don't become one of those people. And I think the quotes themselves need nuance uh, to really make sense. So one I saw the other day, you know, uh, someone was saying was, you know, beyond, the quote is, we've all got as much time as Beyonce. You know, in other words, she's achieving so much with the same amount of time that we, you know, we have. So you know, she'll be inspired. But, you know, the truth is the nuance of that is what well, we don't all have her resources, right? So, you know, it, it, it's always about the detail, isn't it? And, and so what I, what I realized when I'm, when I'm even now today, when I'm trying to help people understand how to be successful, it's it really, you know, I use my own journey, but I want to be very careful to try and make it into simple, simple elements. So for example, you often hear the saying within luck, if I'm lucky, people, if I say I'm lucky, and people that are being polite to me say, well, Simon, you know, you worked hard. And then the people throw out quotes like, the harder you work, the luckier you get. You know, it's not true. The harder you work, the luckier you get is an Instagram quote that is not true. And I see it thrown around all the time. And I know plenty of people that have worked themselves to the bone, ended up mental health issues, physical issues, you know, working hard does not equal success. Many, many, many people have proved this, yet it's still the same thrown around as if that's going to fix all your problems working hard. I was more successful when I worked less hard, when I realized things like I'd started companies and someone else could come in and run it that was better at running the company than me. And then I could work less hard, but that business would do twice, if not three times better. So it was the equivalent of me uh, staying in the business, uh, if you know what I mean. So, so basically, um, just very briefly mentioned that there are three ways to increase your chances of luck. And, and that it's actually a formula. And, and so there's, there are two types of luck. And, and I think if people understood this, they, they'd understand how to make themselves luckier. The first type of luck is the one that's presently in the dictionary. And this is um, random luck. That, and it, but there's a very small amount in the world of random luck, but there are some, for example, where you were born. You know, you can't control that. You are born where you are born. But we all know where you're born does not equal eventually 20 years, 30 years later happiness. We know plenty of people in England, for example, that are born into the royal family that are not happy. Okay, they were born in England into a super wealthy, super famous family. Doesn't mean they're happy 30 years later. Equally, we all know stories of people that were born in very difficult circumstances that end up being happy later. So um, I guess, uh, but, the second type of uh, uh, random luck you could say is coronavirus, right? So, you know, it, it's not inferior anyone's fault. There's a lot of conspiracy theories around but it's no one's fault. It is what it is. It's bad luck in a way for everyone. And, and, but the second type of luck is, is a very different thing. The second type of luck is a, a, a process, a three-step process to achieve. And it, in, in part, summing it up, it would be how you deal with coronavirus. You know, that, that's up to you, whether you see it as a negative or positive, an opportunity to change, an opportunity to improve, an opportunity to innovate in your business. That, that's kind of a, a different choice to the actual accidental luck that's, that's come your way. So, but I, I would just say, you know, as far as tips for getting through coronavirus in this difficult time, you know, my top line is really this concept that if Buddha once said, everyone will have. 10,000 hours of good luck and 10,000 hours of bad luck. And my update to that uh, is we will all have 20,000 hours of good luck if we look at our bad luck the right way.
I love that. That that uh, a wonderful saying. There's also really during this time, as, as we've heard it, this is another saying. It comes from Peter Diamandis. Uh, the world's biggest problems are also the world's biggest business opportunities. So those people, uh, I deal with projects all over the world with World Food Program, the FAO, the United Nations, and those innovations, those projects, those startups that come out of problems where people are saying, hey, I want to solve and get out of the situation that I'm in. I want to improve and, and make my, my luck better um, are having so much success because they're changing their lives. They're changing their situation. They're not developing some kind of a, a project for people in another country, another culture than theirs, they're solving their own problem. They're coming out of that and uh, assessing their own needs. So I really, I, I really like that. And there's that balance, that yin yang type of a balance that, you know, you can look at it as the, it's so bad, but also as, a, as so good, the opportunities that are presented that shows you the systems and our world's kind of broken in, in, in many ways that it can be fixed and changed and improved upon. Um, there's a question that kind of goes along with um, Hong Kong and some of your business dealings. And that is, do you consider yourself to be a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity, one from another? And, um, you know, during this pandemic, the corona is obviously a global citizen. Uh, food's a global citizen, water, food, air, global citizen, species. Um, what are your thoughts and feelings on that? And how, how does that relate to your business and your life? Yeah, without sounding like a crazy person, um, which I'm always conscious that, you know, if, you, if you're not fully awake, some of this stuff might sound mad, but I, I've always felt that we really should be one planet. And, and, I, and I always thought this concept, if, um, if aliens were coming to Earth to destroy us, um, it could be a good thing. Why? Because the whole planet would suddenly stop dividing itself into America and Russia and China and India. And we'd suddenly, you know, better work together um, to, to build things and, and create things that make the world um, safe from this invader. Um, so, um, you know, I'm a fan of Star Trek. And, and so I, lo I love the whole idea that, you know, we, we really are in this together. And the truth is we are, that's, you know, it's so obvious. This is one planet we're on, right? So uh, I think things like coronavirus, it should be one centralized organization coming up with a solution, not Russia racing against America to create a vaccine as if it matters who's first, you yeah. know? And so um, pooling resources will mean that we're all first. And so I've, I've never really understood this concept of separation. In fact, to prove I've never really understood this concept of separation, I invested 10 years ago in a comic book business that did really badly. And by the way, I think failure is a, it's a fantastic thing to experience again and again, because you can learn so much from it. But I, I, I spent uh, over a million US dollars on this business. And, and one of the things, one of the premises of the business and one of the reasons I invested in it was, it was about the earth 6,000 years ago when so-called gods lived on the earth and they had children with humans. It was half, half human, half human. Uh, God children and what they did and some of these kids in theory were good but they did bad things and some of the bad people did good things and so I love that whole thing but the whole continent was completely joined together which of course it was at one point um, in, in Earth's history we can track it back you know dinosaur era the planet uh, was completely one one continent so so I, I think that yeah I think this kind of separation uh, element that's happened through language through culture um, it, it is is something that we we should try to break down, which is why I'm so glad Donald Trump just lost the election. If I'm being honest, no, no any. I'm right with you. I'm ecstatic. Uh, I, got, I got 70 million people that will be uh, you know signing off right now, saying you know we're not listening to you anymore, Simon. But but the, po the point is, you know, ultimately, I, I I believe in in this kind of united planet, and I, and I feel like it it has to be you know to save the planet and frankly to create things that help humanity get through things like AI and get through this kind of social media dilemma we're facing. In a way, we need to unite, have one rule that applies to all companies. Otherwise, what happens you know, with the internet, for example, the company that can get away with breaking the law will move to that country where they're allowed to break the law. So 
you know, we kind of need to unify things. And I think that's one of the big next steps that, that I'm hoping will come um, in my lifetime. I, I really like the, you know, the name of your book, Hack Luck, because there's this big component of hacking. You know, if that's what businesses do. If they can't do certain things in their borders and within their nation, they find a tax oasis or they try to ship their goods or produce their goods somewhere else to get around these loopholes. And, and it's just a different form of hacking. Well, it's not good, bad, or ugly. It's just, if we're not unified, then we're going to find a way to continue business regardless. And so uh, we, we've got to keep moving forward. So I really like that. Um, it's interesting because I wrote a, a, a screenplay uh, with a German lady here in Hamburg and it was uh, called Destiny's Colliding. It's very similar to this comic book story that you, that you discussed, which was real interesting. But it, it's also, uh, I'm sorry you, uh, sorry you lost, but it was a good lesson learned. But what's interesting, if you've ever read Yuval Noah Harari's books at all, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and, uh, or any of the other books, uh, 21 Questions, um, that he's written or heard him speak, he just came out with a comic book of his book, Sapiens, so that we could all kind of have this more, a different form of median for a very complex and deep subject matter. So I, I like when, when things kind of Star Trek or put it in a comic book or a fictional type of a, a, a situation. It's very nice to, to see that. So that's, that's interesting. I, I'm going to hit you real hard with my hardest question now that we'll probably have today. Um, and it's the burning question, WTF. And that's not the swear word that most people would think. It's actually, what's the future? What's the future of this journey for you? Now, I don't want to know politics or what the world, uh, for Simon Squibb, what's the future? I guess I'm doing what I can and hopefully eventually, um, able to follow through to to show a few things to the world first of all you know business can be good and that there are people doing business that can do good i don't think people that have been successful should be vilified um, i don't think just because you've made money and i i'm a multimillionaire you know i don't think because i'm a multimillionaire i should be vilified i think the only way to um balance things out is is to take your success and wealth and, and make sure you pass it on to others so I'm on a mission, I guess, to also um, bring value to the word free. So it's been an interesting experience for me in the last 12 months to give people advice, insights, knowledge, contacts for free. Uh, and, and there's almost like a suspicion uh, built into the system these days that the only way it works is if you charge money for something. And so I, I don't know how money has become such a real thing. It's the first virtual reality item we've bought into. People are literally happy or sad based on what they think they've got in their bank. And I feel like it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on a mission to kind of bring value to free, to show that not everybody who's made money is, is, is evil and, and that um, being successful can be a good thing. And I think that you don't need to tread on people to be successful. And I, I want to counteract the kind of some of the business cultural elements that are out there that, you know, if you don't charge something, it's not valuable or you know, you've got to tread on people to get ahead, um, all these silly quotes like the harder you work, the luckier you are. You know, the, I, I almost feel like these are like um, slogans baked into the system to make people go and work for you. <laughs> you know, if you work hard one day, you can be rich like me when that person then goes and plays golf all day. I mean, Trump lost the election while he was losing the election, he's playing golf, right? So, you know, I, I just feel like um, I, I, my, my mission now is to, to uh, be a present father, be a good father, be an example for my child um, of how you should operate in the world. He's three, I want him to see that being kind, and being generous and being patient are good things and there are rewards for being that way. And, and I don't want him to see, and I was on this path, but I've made a lot of money, I was very successful, I was getting more and more power uh, and, and I don't feel that that necessarily is the right thing to focus on. So, so switching out and, and focusing on helping people, giving people things for free without any expectations in return, sharing with my son that journey. I'm hoping I leave the world a better place for him and leave him a legacy to perhaps do what I'm doing times 1,000. Hopefully he can do even more good 
are for people. Uh, maybe he'll be the person working with your family to create a united planet. Um, who knows? But we have to start somewhere. And, and so I'm doing my bit to, to try and give back. And that's, you know, I see the rest of my life playing out that way, try, trying to bring value to free, trying to bring uh, value to people without any expectation in return, try and help people break through their limiting belief systems, help people get luck, which is why I've, I figured out a formula for luck. I think you all, we all need luck to be successful. I, I'm only successful because I'm lucky. So, but there's a formula to it. There's a, there's a process, a three-step process you can go through to getting luckier. I'm on a mission to update the dictionary so that people can see that because someone made it, their next door neighbor made it and they didn't, and they worked really hard, they don't get bitter about it. They realize that maybe there was a formula that person followed that isn't just work hard uh, to, 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 to be successful. And, and everyone deserves the, the right to have that formula in their hand and, and give it a go. Was there a certain mentor or, or thing that happened and occurred so after you sold fluid that kind of changed that course you said you initially started writing the book and it was kind of very um, focused on you instead of on what you've given back to the world and was there like a mentor or somebody who kind of helped you on that transition was it the birth of your son or was it shortly after some kind of a, a event at all well i have been married for 20 years and uh, I love my wife and she is a wonderful human being. And, and I think she has been my mentor in many ways. She has helped me. I mean, I grew up in a family that was quite capitalistic and quite, you know, my mother today, you mentioned that I still, I, I realize that some members of your family, you know, you don't have to like them, right? Just because you're born into that family, it yeah. doesn't, you end up having to like them. You know, and, and I and I have a I, I have a, a thread to my mum, but honestly, I don't like her. She's a racist, and I'm married to a Chinese person. You know, like, and and so I don't I don't particularly like my mother, but she's my mother, so I'm trying to be respectful uh, to, towards her. But but having said that, you know, I, I feel like that there is definitely a, a piece of me that wants to um, help people realign them, their mindset around what is good and what is bad. I mean, in school, for example, no one's ever taught moral code. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not shown in any way what is right or wrong. Uh, and, and I don't, and I think in business, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things wrong. I do think avoiding tax is wrong. I know you, you know, you can hack that, uh, but I don't think it's the right thing to do. If you're making money in a country based on people in that country, you should be paying your fair share to bring support and help to those that don't have the money to do it themselves. And so I think, you know, I, I just I just want to bring balance back, if that makes sense. I love that. Uh, is there some certain sustainability models or some uh, resilience models that you kind of, you know, are the pillars or uh, definitely principles in, in your business models of startups you help or ones that you invest in and you say, you know, this is, these are the models that I want to push and, and support, but also for you that have kind of, uh, promoted that as, uh, as a social business or a, a sustainable businesses out there that you could yeah. tell us about? Well, I, I, I'll finish off the question you asked me previously because it actually ties into the question you're now asking. You know, the, the, when I sold my last company, Fluid, to PwC, initially my first instinct was to uh, grow bigger. So I started a platform called Meta, which is in Nairobi, Africa and Hong Kong. Um, and, and I basically wanted to go bigger, not, not stop working, actually. My initial instinct was not to stop working. But then um, I realized that I was perhaps just after power. And then I wondered how much of an impact I was actually having, other than you know, having more people work for me and, and getting more prestige uh, out, out in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, everybody, everybody in Asia, pretty much, you, know, you talk about entrepreneurship, my name will come up. I, I was sponsored by a big institution to go and talk about entrepreneurship. But, but I felt like I was starting to get to a point where I was always charging people for my advice. So I get paid to go and do public speaking, for example. But I always felt like, what about the people that can't afford to go to that event and pay? You know, what about the unemployed people that can't afford a business coach or to hire an agency like the one I owned to help them? Now, who's going to help those people? And I felt like I was, you know, because I was increasing my staff costs, increase, you have to keep feeding the machine. And slowly but surely, you get further and further away from that 15-year-old me, you know? 
So I think, you know, I, I had a conversation with my wife, as I mentioned earlier, she's always been an inspiration to me. And I said, look, you know, I carry on this path. I'm going to make another 30 million pounds. But so what? You know, what, what am I going to do with, with all this money? And, and secondly, you know, is, is it money that I need? And I felt like I needed to go back and help that 15-year-old me. But it took me about three or four months of struggling with the capitalistic nature that I built up. You know, when you have to pay the rent when you're 15 years old and survive, you, you do shut off a little bit of the purpose feeling and you just need to pay the bills and survive. But as I got more comfortable, I think that woke up in me and my wife helped me uh, that wake up in me. So I had a second awakening, really. Uh, I had the first one, which was awakening into the entrepreneur world and realizing what an amazing world it was and that I was an entrepreneur. And then I had a second awakening, I think, um, a few years back when um, I sold my company and I realized that I could actually help someone that was unemployed. I didn't need to get paid. Whereas well, everything up to that point, my agency Fluid and my investment firm Nest um, and all the businesses in between had all been geared up around the premise that we will do this for you if you do this for us. And so I wanted to play in the space that you're unemployed, you don't have any money. How can I help you get out of that situation? And, and you know, of course, it's sometimes for people, it's awkward. They're like, well, I can't pay you. I'm like, I don't need money. And they're like, well, what do you want from me? You know, there's that awkward period. But, but I, I love the idea that it's like, no, I, I just want to help you. You know, there, there, there's no catch. You know, like, wake up. There are people out there that actually are like this. Let me prove it to you. Let me give you advice and let help you through. The... So, so, you know, just because you asked about awakening earlier and you asked about the moment and you asked about well, I had mentors and they're all kind of the, the same answer. Um, so, so I wanted to make sure I answered that properly. Uh, you, you definitely did. And I, I love that, and especially that it was your wife, and and that uh, probably makes you guys a pretty powerful couple and, and a, a great team, you know, to support each other. And um, I, I, I've always seen. Um, well, no, that's not true. I haven't always seen, but for at least twenty years, I've seen business as a, a business romance type of a situation. Tim Laborecht is a good friend of mine. He wrote the book, The Business Romantic. And that I want to work with people that I love, that I trust, and, and I, 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 in a job or, or something that I jump out of bed that I'm excited to do, something that I have passion about and purpose for. And so I realized that that's so vital to have that you know, tie to business romance, that you spend the majority of your time, what people call work, um, uh, away from those that you love the most. And so if you're going to spend that time, why wouldn't you want to trust and like and, and, and be around those? And, and so I really, I love that fact that, that you shared that. Um, to, to go back a little bit more because uh, you, you didn't 100% answer the question about the purposeful project or your podcast and kind of how that has developed and, and um, maybe even been affected during this time of the lockdown, because I know you were actually going into the libraries, trying to get people back into the libraries and, and, and do that. I'd like to hear more. My listeners would like to hear more around that, but also how, how that ties into this goal of what your mission is, what you've said this whole time, to reach a million people and help them start a business, to get them out there and show them that it's easy, that they can, or that that it is doable given the tools and the free freeness to make it work. Well, the, um, the mission to help a million people start a business of their own and make sure anyone running a business doesn't feel alone doing it is both a big ambition and a small ambition. I mean, in the COVID world, in UK alone, there is a million people expected to be laid off over the course of the previous six months and the on oncoming six months. And so, you know, a million people doesn't sound like a lot when you put it in context of what is potentially happening right now, thanks to, to COVID's impact. So that's a million people that would otherwise be doing something every day uh, and, and having something to keep their brains occupied. So, um, but I, I basically felt like we needed to build a system that was scalable because I've only got so many hours in a day. And one of my things about helping people be successful in some, some respects, you've got to learn to buy time, not sell time. But from, so from my type, you know, there's only so many um, hours in a day. So how can I help people that isn't just me personally giving up time, which I do do. And, um, you know, I've got tomorrow, I've got 18 phone calls 
uh, with, with people that need help. So I, I'm on it. I give people 15 minute slots and, and, and often I can help them quite a lot in that period of time. But, but there's got to be more than just me giving my time for free to help. So there's a couple of things that we, we started. So under the Purposeful Project banner, which, which has this big lofty goal of helping a million people start a business of their own, um, I would just like to say we've already helped 52 people start a business of their own. So that's a good start. But we, um, we, we, we felt like, what could we do? So one of the things we, 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 we did and we're doing is we interview the world's most successful entrepreneurs and we get them to share their story about how they did it. What I didn't want to do was kind of the Gary V model, which is just which stand on a soapbox telling everybody how brilliant I am and this is what they should do. Um, I, I do think I'm brilliant. Uh, I do have an opinion about what you should do, but my view on the world and my background and my skill set and uh, what I know uh, as a privileged white person living in England might not be relevant to certain individuals in the world. So I felt it would be amazing to interview the world's most successful entrepreneurs from different backgrounds and different starts in life to download how they did it so that uh, anyone listening out there could relate to that individual. Because some people relate to my story and some people won't. And I get it a lot on, on social media, but like, you know, it's easy for you to say that, you know, white, white privilege. And, you know, I have to probably agree. There's, there's an element of it for sure. So, um, so I like to um, have a balanced view. So we've interviewed 54 people. Um, I've actually, I don't want to interview people like Elon Musk, uh, partly because uh, he's, he's been heard from enough and we all know his views. Uh, I have nothing against him, but I want people that perhaps are a little bit more relatable for people. Elon Musk almost seems like an anonymy for a lot of people. He's like not, not real. He's a billionaire. It's crazy. He's you know, he, he's amazing. I could never be that. And, and I actually, what I tried to do is, is interview just normal people. Frankly, people like me, I came from nothing. You know, I, I was homeless. I was, I was 15 years old. I had no, edu no real education of merit other than the basics. I'm dyslexic. Um, and, and so, you know, I, always, I do honestly feel if I could make it, anyone can make it. So, but, but again, I only can really say that to a certain demographic. So, so I, I, that's what we did. We did a podcast show. It's just voted as one of the 20 most popular podcasts in the world. Um, and I'm pretty proud of that. We're, we're up there with Joe Rogan and all the others. Um, and and we, you know, we, we just tell it as it is. We're not sugarcoating entrepreneurship. No, no journey is, is easy. But we are explaining the freedoms that it brings and how you can achieve success in entrepreneurship with nuance, not with an Instagram post, some inspirational you know, work harder, you'll get lucky stuff, but, but more, you know, granular, like, you know, how did you solve this problem? How did you push through that pain? What was that thing that allowed you to push through and, and be um, owning the world's largest online bank, like one of my guests owns called Simon Long, he owns a bank called WeLab, you know, he was working in a bank seven years ago. He was, you know, he promised promotion um, and didn't get it and, and decided, right, I'm going to start my own bank. He now owns the world's largest bank. And what's interesting about a lot of these people is most people have never even heard of these people. Um, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily, you know, Elon Musk jumping on stage looking for PR. They're, 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 they're in back office making things happen. And so, um, you know, for, for, that's what we did. We decided to do a podcast show and we felt that that was a good way to inspire people. A lot of the time, the stories themselves that these entrepreneurs tell within the podcast also help people get through difficult moments because we've all had them, whether it's coronavirus. I mean, I went through SARS in Hong Kong in 2003. That was coronavirus 1.0, literally uh, medically, it was coronavirus 1.0. It was the first iteration um, of, of coronavirus. Yeah. And I was living and working in Hong Kong in 2003 when that happened. And we tripled our business during the equivalent of lockdown in, in, in Hong Kong because we moved all of our focus to online businesses. Uh, and we grew, you know, and brands like Alibaba were coming up during that time. And we were spending a lot more than the more traditional um, supermarket businesses, for example. So anyway, um, I guess ultimately, you know, there's always going to be a, a, a reason to uh, not, not push forward. But we, we, did, we did find that you know, during difficult times like SARS, my businesses actually grew. And today we're trying to make sure that people realize that difficult times are also a big opportunity. So bad luck is also good luck. So I keep, keep saying, you know, there's three ways to hack luck. There's a three-step process to it. And if you, if you follow it, then, you know, you can turn a bad, bad situation into a good situation.
I, I really like that because, you know, there's the, the big discussion always, you know, do we want to have mentors like Elon Musk? Everybody wants the influencers and the big guys as mentor, but the best mentors really, like you said, your wife, uh, my dad's my best mentor ever. Um, people that are close to you are, are wonderful mentors to be around, to, to have that are close and local. And the ones that the rest of the world probably doesn't hear about are also doing pretty well and being pretty successful and have some great stories to share. Um, you, I've seen some of your uh, podcasts. I've, I've listened to them. And, you know, you found some uh, TikTok that the uh, entrepreneur that has started business is very successful, got 3 million views, um, does his own videos, does his own Instagram. I would push everybody that I know to, to your social media channels, to your websites. I'll put them in the list and description to go check you out, to, to join in and find your wisdom, to, to get your mentorship and to get that extra little help and nudge to, to move forward for the future because I'm really seeing that, that you're giving the information away, you're helping some people and I, I thank you for that. I, that's really important to do. I like uh, that that line of thought because those are usually the most powerful mentors and the type, most powerful type of wisdom. People that put on their pants just like you and I do, who get up every morning, who have families, who who have been there and done it, um, are going to be straightforward and easy to reach and give you the information to make this world a better place. So I mean, I I think the reason you want to help a million people become entrepreneurs and start that is because why? Because you think there's uh, more purposeful people in the world that so the world will be better. What, what is your reason behind that? What's the true, let's, let's be honest and open with people. What do you get out of that? Well, I think first of all, um, I'm going back and helping that 15 year old me, you know, it's uh, just healing your inner child. Um, of sorts. I, I started when I was 15 years old um, and it was hard on my own. You know, no, no one taught me about um, cash flow or money management or hiring people with moral code, how, how that could work, partnerships, um, what a mentor was, what a coach was, what the difference was, what, what scale meant, what purpose meant. That was never taught to me in, in my home or school. And so, you know, I, I learned all of these things the hard way. And, and I feel like a lot of the principles of being an entrepreneur can be taught and they're not. And I think it's because it's explained as some mystical thing that some people are born to do and some people aren't. I mean, no one's born to do anything. We're all born at zero. I see it in my son. He's a product based on how we teach him. So we're, no one's born a doctor, no one's born a lawyer. You know, th these, these things have to be taught. So a big part of me is, is you know, to answer it simply, is, is going back and helping that 15 year old me. The fact that the average person I'm helping is more like 27, highlights to you just at what stage in people's lives they wake up and realize that that job that they were promised either isn't gonna materialize or the job that they have got isn't the one they thought it was gonna be. That beautiful brand and that image of what their job was gonna be isn't what, it, what, it, what they thought it was gonna be. It's not purposeful. As they thought it was going to be it's not as enjoyable as they thought it was going to be and and that's the moment i kind of want people to realize that you know you don't need to wait for someone to give you a job you can create your own and i think it's because the second element isn't just going back to that 15 year old me and helping me but it's also giving the gift that i was given to as many people as i can that you realize that you know being free to spend your days on things that make a difference not spending your days on what someone else tells you to do so you can earn money to pay your mortgage in a house that you don't really need. You know, I just want people to see the difference and have the ability and the option to make a decision to be an entrepreneur. And even if they use those skills to then get a job, I still think it's useful skills that everyone deserves to have. And I wish that someone had taught them to me. So I guess in a way, I'm still going back to that point of helping that 15 year old me. I think that's where, that's where the selfish piece comes in. I, I'm, I wish someone had helped me and I'm going back and doing just that. Um, and, and, and so uh, at 15 years old, I, I didn't have any money. I wouldn't be able to pay someone for help. So I want to make sure I'm removing that barrier from the equation. And so, um, 
yeah, so, so I mean, I guess, there's the, you know, that's probably the truth of it. Um, I like to think that I've, I've, I'm aware of that selfish need to go back and help that 15-year-old me, but it, it, it's a good selfish need because it means that I'm actually doing something good. I'm, I'm giving to those that, that deserve it. And you asked me about the library, and this is how the, the library ties in. Now, I know in the US, libraries still are given a lot of respect and, and libraries perhaps aren't in as much trouble. But in the UK, the, library in, the libraries in the UK, we've had about 700 of them closed in the last three years. Um, the present conservative government here doesn't really see them as that important and i would say that they've never sat in one for a day to see how important they actually are a lot of people use them as a way of for example of getting on the internet a lot of people can't afford the monthly fees that internet broadband suppliers charge to get online and they can't afford to sit in a coffee shop and pay four pounds or whatever six dollars for a coffee to get access to the internet. So, so how do they connect to what's going on in the world? So they go to a library. The library in the UK is still the only place you can walk in where no one asks you for money as soon as you walk through the door. And, and so um, I feel now in particular more than ever, libraries are actually needed to keep communities connected and to help the most vulnerable amongst us. But they're all about to close. And um, COVID has only sped up the problem. The problem already existed, partly because the library model in the UK was originally funded as a community service requirement by the government. But that has been stopped. They didn't see it as vital because they don't understand the value of community and they don't understand what it's like for the poorest amongst us. And so I was walking past one of my um, local libraries and saw that it was closed down and in disrepair. And I had an idea to take my mission of helping 1 million people start a business of their own and giving people the tools to be entrepreneurs and so on, aligning with the library mission. And this is how I viewed it. The library is not a place where books sit. The library, in my view, is a place where knowledge sits. The fact that one format of knowledge is books is just one format. So I believe the future of libraries is taking knowledge and putting it in many different formats, including, for example, a podcast where and, and then I, I looked at the library ecosystem and I looked at it like, um, I mean, you've got WeWorks in the US, you've got WeWorks here, the brand. You know, again, WeWorks is designed, if you can afford to pay for a fancy office and a fancy chair in a fancy office, then you go to WeWorks, right? But what about those that can't afford to pay for that seat at WeWorks? They shouldn't have access to that network. They shouldn't have access to capital to help them grow their businesses. They shouldn't have access to, to knowledge. So the library can, can replace that. In the COVID world, how that also tra translates in my mind is I've managed to mobilize a whole series of successful entrepreneurs for the podcast. And I mobilized them yet again to do things like office hours. And what we do is, and I'm doing this tomorrow, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we basically offer entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs zoom in, zoom out. So we're in the library. It doesn't matter where we are, really, but just symbolically, the knowledge sits inside the library. You zoom in, you ask an entrepreneur a question about your business, and then you zoom out. And it doesn't matter if you've got money or not, just like the library, we will help you. And so, um, and the way we scale it is we put that kind of model in every library across the world, hopefully and eventually. And we take the library and we don't, we, we turn it into an entrepreneur hub, an entrepreneur center. And then the library has a new lease of life. And, and after school, you go to school as you normally would. And then after school, um, school hasn't taught you anything about entrepreneurship. It hasn't taught you about how to do anything in business properly. Uh, but after school, you can go to the library and in the library will be a whole series of knowledge based uh, bits of kit uh, that will allow you to learn how to do a podcast, for example, or, or teach you how to, to get your YouTube channel up and running or help you get better on Instagram and, and help you um, do the things that I think are going to uh, keep you um, interested in life later that aren't just, you know, um, learn to be a, a lawyer and then go be a lawyer only to realize that you don't enjoy it. I like to give people all this access. And that's what the library brings to, to our mission. And hopefully by bringing our mission to the library, we can save libraries, uh, which, which is, you know, um, it's, it's all synced up, but that, that's the that libraries to us, are, they follow our ethos. We, we want to help people for free. The libraries want to help people for free. We want to give people knowledge. The libraries want to give people knowledge. So it makes total sense that our organization teams up with the network of libraries and, and tries, to, tries to bring uh, their mission back to life and take our mission together to the market. That's absolutely a wonderful mission. And you know, this mission that you have of reaching a million people is real similar to Simon Sinek's why. Um, and then you discuss a lot about purpose. 
Um, just to, for our listeners or those who might not always know um, about some of those things, one of the very first podcasts that I ever did was with a good friend of mine, John P. Strelecki. He wrote uh, numerous books here in Germany. He sells a book every 26 minutes, but his um, book that I like the most is The Big Five for Life. It talks about your purpose for existing. It talks about uh, finding the big five well, for life is, is uh, applicable to hunting in Africa or seeing the, the big five species, but it's really about finding your five purposes or your big things in, in life and this creating every day this museum moment where uh, if you were to walk people through the museum of life, that they could see your purpose and know your mission and know where you've gone with that. And, and I really like those type of tools, tips, and tricks for those who are, might be just starting out on this journey of entrepreneurship. I, you know, I've also owned 17 companies, currently own a, a few, and am involved in numerous organizations. So I want to help people, just as you do, make this journey, make this transition to show them the tools, the skills, the, the speak, the, the abilities to do that. Uh, that are out there that are really actually free. They're actually free. They can be divided by free. They can be found at libraries. They can be found online. And so I, I am just fully in line with you on, on, on uh, the terminology you use and not what you want to depart. The library system is such a wonderful project that you guys are, are involved in. And it's one that already exists that you're updating the business model to our current state of the world, uh, keeping up to date with our exponentially growing world. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I have really kind of um, three, four big questions left for you. Um, the last three are really for my listeners as a sustainable takeaway for them, what they can apply into their lives. But before that, one last question from you um, on, Similar to the burning question, WTF, but it's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, um, without sounding like a socialist, I guess I believe that wealth should be equally distributed and that everyone should be given the same amount of opportunities. Um, and maybe it's also idealistic, but you know, I don't think because in England, for example, if you want to be prime minister, you have to go to Eton. That's what it feels like. Everybody who's ever become prime minister seems to have gone to some you know, very exclusive school. And I don't think that it should be that way. I think it should be about who's best for the job and who's going to do the best for the country they lead. So I'd like to see the level, level playing field play out a bit. And, and I, don't, I don't like the idea that, um, you know, I didn't like the trend of billionaires becoming presidents. Um, so I'm glad I'm glad that has actually fallen away a little bit, even with Mayor Bloomberg, who I, I quite like. I'm glad he didn't get the nominee uh, for the Democratic Party. And, and I'm glad that Trump just lost the election. You know, so, so I think my world would, would, would be more equal and, and everything is based on your, frankly, your attitude, your, your, your merit, your willingness to learn, and, and and those things and so there's a part of me that hopes that you know technology will bring this about with things like universal income playing a part where it's not about how much you earn but about the impact that you have in the world and how that impact affects you personally and what your contribution is personally and it shouldn't all be about how much money you earn I think I mean I say every single day in a lot of my communications and you know, I'm a multi-millionaire I don't really like saying it uh, it, and I'm English, so we, you know, we, we don't actually like speaking like this, but I do know that it means something to people, that if you can prove that you have made it, therefore you've got knowledge that's worthwhile listening to, which is a little bit sad too, because I think there's a lot of people I know that have failed miserably, that have a lot of knowledge to share, a lot of insight to share. So I hope that the world becomes more balanced and people realise that success isn't about how much money you've got, but about what you've done to help other people and what you've done uh, that made the world a better place as cheesy as it sounds and I think that's what the world would look like as far as I'm concerned it, it would look like people are, are, are praised based on 
the good that they've done, not the, the balance in their bank account. So you caveated a couple of your statements before, you know, kind of that don't want to seem too crazy about saying we need aliens or what if an alien visited us, what would they say that were humanities divided from me, from itself, or you've caveated, you know, the, the Trump, and, and I'm full alignment with that. Can I get, can I, can I tease you or maybe uh, ask you some, uh, a, a couple more questions before we wrap up the final questions that maybe you might need a caveat again um, that that also have to do with this thing that what I'm hearing goes against your way of doing business or your thoughts or feelings as well in, in, in life and, and in your businesses. And that is, you know, racism and division and how, how we do that. You don't need to be a millionaire to start a business. You don't need to have the success at, at the beginning and you can fail and, and, and learn these wisdoms. What about the Brexit? How do you feel about that, the whole Brexit vote? And do you think there's, do you want to address that, that there was some form of racism and some form of in, uh, jobs that was kind of pushing the fear of that vote? And then now that that's occurred, that, in my opinion, wouldn't there be tons of jobs available now to jump into because there's no one from outside, immigrant workers are no longer coming or taking those jobs or, mm. you know yeah, what I mean? History will always tell you the future, right? If you study history carefully enough, it can give you a very clear idea of human nature and, and what happens. And, you know, I know it gets brought up a lot, but you only have to look at the rise of Hitler to understand, you know, if you blame a particular thing for all your problems in the world, in theory, that one thing is fixed and all your problems will go away, right? So, yeah. you know, that's basically Brexit. It, it, there, there are a lot of, uh, like the things I just alluded to in my ideal world, yeah. there was a lot of people that had been disenfranchised by technology. There are a lot of people that have been left behind uh, by technology and they feel aggrieved. And so um, who do they blame? And, and so you give them someone to blame and, and, and that seems like, you know, the, the, you have like a pressure cooker and there's a, there's a release, right? It's like, okay, well, let's get rid of those immigrants. And, you know, suddenly um, uh, we're, 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 everything will be fine. Everything will be fine think, unless it's think, not. Yeah. I think, you know, without, um without judging you know i i feel like as always with the world you know, we, we, there's a lot of simplification going on and so when you break down the facts um the, the truth is that immigration is a critical part of making an economy work and anybody who has any understanding of economics knows that you know you you need all diverse types in an economy to make it work and so um and so you know america was built on the back of Im Im immigrants and those that were immigrants yesterday are today's mainstream american tycoons yeah. and you know the, the statue of liberty says it best right i mean you want you want the hungry and you want the poor you you know there's always going to be uh not only the right thing to do to help people like that um, but it also eventually, you know, like anything good you do in the world eventually pays off for those that are doing good. And I think America is a great example of that exact philosophy. And so um, I think, you know, it is it is a complex issue, uh, Brexit, and I'm not sure anyone wants to hear about it anymore. Oh, no, you answered it perfectly. Yeah, but I would, ju I would just I would just say that, you know, I, I, I do genuinely, genuinely feel that Brexit is just a political game set out by an elite bunch of out of touch people um, sold as the um, ultimate solution to a very complex problem and in the end it is all bullshit you know brexit will either happen in uh, spirit only to uh, appease the people that voted for the people that wanted the power and the people with power will continue to really develop things in their own idiotic way half signed to help them and half just to get through the day without having to work too hard so you know uh, I, I don't have much respect for the political elite i don't think they've ever done a hard day's work in their life most of them 
They certainly, I don't think, are in it to help other people. And that's just the way politics generally is. And I think once you accept that, you stop asking the government to solve your problems for you and you start solving them for yourself, you'll be happier a lot quicker. I love that. That's perfect. Uh, when you uh, initially first brought up uh, Trump and, and uh, us being aligned there as well, I'm, I'm actually, you know, really ecstatic of, of the results uh, and uh, uh, see it as a new day and some new hope that move, start moving in the right direction. But what I thought was so humorous is um, they, they said, you know, he's off golfing while, you know, while waiting for the election results and things. And they said it's his 209th time since he's been in office that he's been golfing. So he's been in, in, uh, since 2016, he's went golfing 209 times. Um, I'll tell you what, boy, that, that's uh, for, the, for somebody who's supposed to be leading, that sounds like pretty elitist and, and crazy thing. It's okay to have vacations and and things like that, but 209 times, that's a, a little bit more than a 30 day vacation allotment that most people don't even get around the world. So I, I just I just hope that it stops people saying the harder you work, the luckier you get. Because if you want yeah. to be uh, president of the United States, learn to play golf. Yeah, learn to play you know, golf. Like it, it really, um, it, you know, this, the people that will tell you the, hard, the harder you work, the luckier you get are the people that are actually playing golf telling you it. Yep, yep, yep. So start realizing that it's about, um, I think, hacking luck. Uh, yeah. It's not about following some bullshit Instagram post that yeah. tells you, um, you, know, you work hard, then you too can, can, can be like me. Just start being like that, like that already, you know, I enjoy agree. your life. Enjoy what you do every day. Is that, that is success. I mean, you mentioned it a little bit earlier and I, 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 I live by this. You know, I, 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 people think that they get a mortgage because they want to own a house because they want to be wealthy. And I say, well, you know, do you enjoy what you do every day? If you enjoy what you do every day, you don't need a big fancy house to fill the hole. Um, you know, you, you will just enjoy what you do every day and, and everything else follows after that, in my view. Yeah, that, that's another thing that because of the lockdown period, more of us have been able to see our human zoos, the homes that we live in, the buildings, apartments, et cetera. And through that process, we've actually seen, I don't, I don't want to be here 24 seven. I've created a place that's not that enjoyable on a lockdown nonstop. So I, I totally I totally agree that, uh, that I have three more last uh, takeaways and it's mainly for my listeners. I, w I would like you to give them a sustainable takeaway and uh, free gifts for them. If there was one message you could depart to them um, that was a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change your life, what would it be, your message? Well, it's hard to pick one, but I think the overarching theme I'd probably put forward is um, that ultimately success is, is defined by you, not by society, not by other people's opinion. And I, I really believe that if you can home in on not filling a market gap, for example, which a lot of people pitch me a business, they're filling a market gap with this idea, but instead they're doing something they really love that may or may not fill a market gap. Uh, I think that just a precursor to, to being successful, I think is, is defining what success is for you. And I think success is about enjoying what you do every day. And I'm not talking about being happy every day, that's impossible. I'm talking about something you alluded to earlier too, which is you jump out of bed every day and you're kind of excited to get stuck in. And, and I would say to anybody that doesn't have that feeling, invest in that first. Don't invest in the stock market or buying a property or any of these things that are going to distract you and potentially trap you. Because debt is a trap, right? That will trap you then to do the thing you don't love, to pay for the things you don't really need, to impress people you don't really care about. You know, and I think that go all the way back to the basics and, and, and make sure you, you spend time figuring out what it is you, you love to do. And if you're not sure what it is you love to do, go work with people that do love what they do. And you'll soon be so infected by that feeling. You will either fall in love with their mission or you will find yours. Perfect. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Say, boy, if I would have known that 20 years ago. That bad luck is good luck. Great. 
I, I won't even go into depth because you've touched upon it in your book as well or in, in what, what you mentioned to us today. Are there uh, two or three actions that uh, um, people, decision makers could take to, to, to accelerate or impact uh, their field as being an entrepreneur, some actions that they could take? Do more things free. It has more value than you think. Great. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it, Simon. It was a joy and a pleasure. Unless you have something you want to ask me, we're done today. No. Um, if any of your listeners want to reach out, you can connect to me through my website, simonscript.com. If you're interested in helping us help 1 million people start a business of their own, you can connect to us through the purposefulproject.com. And if you want to hear the stories of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, how they did it, what they learned, then connect uh, to the podcast show through goodluckpod.com. I will put that all in the show notes and I'm sure many will reach out to you. So good to see you again. Please take care and we'll speak soon again. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.